This is TTT Live. I'm Mahalia Joseph Wharton. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Suite 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, Al Alexander. Good morning and welcome to another Ministry of Health virtual media conference which provides you with clear and accurate information on COVID-19. We also recognize the day as World Blood Donor Day which takes place on the 14th of June each year. The theme for this year is Give Blood and Keep the World Beating. The aim of World Blood Donor Day is to raise global awareness of the need for safe blood and blood products for transfusion and of the critical contribution voluntary, unpaid blood donors make to national health systems. We thank our regular blood donors for their commitment and encourage those who can donate to do so. At today's media conference, we have with us Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Joanne Paul, Regional Coordinator, Emergency Medicine, NCRHA, and Dr. Janine St. Bernard, County Medical Officer of Health for Karani. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will be your moderator for this morning's media conference. I now invite Dr. Parasram to present the latest clinical update. Dr. Parasram. Hi, good morning, Al. Um, good morning as well to Dr. Paul, to Dr. St. Bernard, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. We begin as uh, with the first slide, um, which is an update as of the 13th of June 2021. Total persons uh, tested so far 208,400. Of those in the last 24 hours, we would have reported 301 new positive cases, taking our total till since 12th of March 2020 to 28,723. Our total recovered patients so far 18,804 and our total active cases at 9,249. We are now at 690, 70 deaths and 484 persons in hospital at this time. In step-down facilities, 134. In our, at our quarantine sites, 226. And those in home isolation, Dr. St. Bernard will go into some detail as some home care tips later on, 8,330. We're looking at um, a further breakdown of the hospital cases. So within the system, Hoover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, 136, 12 in ICU, 35 in HDU. At the Cora Hospital, 79, Augustus Long, 46, St. Anne's Hospital, 36, Arima General Hospital, 63, New Point Fortin Hospital, 49, St. James Medical Complex, 45, Scarborough Regional Hospital, Fort King George, 27, and Scarborough General Hospital, Signal Hill, 3. Step down facilities, 134, are broken down as follows. At the Claxton Bay Correctional Facility, one person. UE Deby, 26, UTT Valsine, 13, Point Fortin Area Hospital, 35, Field Hospital at Jean Pair, 27, Field Hospital at Hoover, 11, Port of Spain General Hospital, step down, Nil at this time, Takarigo Facility 12 and Tobago 9. Just to break down further the vaccination drive so far, total persons vaccinated 158,515 with their first dose and it's broken down AstraZeneca 83,554, Sinopharm 74,961 and our total persons fully vaccinated to date second dose 11,649. Al, that's my clinical update for this morning. Thank you, CMO. As we have recently seen in the media, children are not immune from contracting COVID. Dr. Paul will share with us how children infected with COVID in Trinidad and Tobago have been coping. Dr. Paul. Hi, thank you very much, Al. Um, Chief Medical Officer, <clears throat> Dr. Sin Bernard, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for inviting me again. I just want to talk, I'll give you a few points about COVID-19 and children. So just to go through, we've mentioned this before. So we know the first thing is to reinforce. 
that in children who are infected with COVID-19, most of the cases are very mild or asymptomatic. As we mentioned, we have less receptors, which means they have less viral particles coming into their system, <clears throat> which means, though, that they're able to transmit less viral particles, and therefore they'll be less infectious. But the thing is that they will fool us because because they're asymptomatic, although they're less infectious, um, because of that, we'll presume we don't have that visual cue. So if we see an adult coughing, we'll think, okay, let me put, put my guard up. If we see a child running around, we'll think, okay, they probably are not infectious, but they are asymptomatic, which means that we have to make more of an effort in terms of the three W's to wash our hands, wear our mask, and watch our distance. In addition, show our children. So they usually just look at our cues also. They learn from us. So once we do it, they learn to do the same thing because they themselves, although they're less infectious, they are asymptomatic and they can also infect us and pass it on to persons at risk. So I want us to so like make more of an effort understanding that they are mild but still at some risk per se. The other thing to note is also, we mentioned this a few times, about having severe COVID. Now, although we know that the majority of, uh, of children do not have severe COVID, at least 1% of them will be admitted to hospital with severe COVID, so it's not unusual. We have had a case recently in the newspaper. And the thing is that the risk factors are less than two years old. In addition, obesity, diabetes, and genetic factors. So those children, just to remember, the key things to look out for is not like adults where they have respiratory signs. They usually would have other systems, for instance, GI or gastrointestinal or bowel. The first thing is that they'll have is diarrhea. That's very common, much more than even vomiting. So diarrhea, vomiting, in terms of the heart, they'll have high heart rate. They'll have a high pulse. They will have their, um, they'll be a little bit maybe... Um, what we call cargo in children, lethargic, um, have a fast, um, they look a bit pale, a little bit, just it's a little bit dusky. It just signs you're looking out for in terms of the heart is that function as well. In addition, the last system is the brain. They might be a bit confused, a little bit um, drowsy, not quite themselves. So we're looking at brain, we're looking at heart, we're looking at bowel. Those three systems in particular in children are affected much more than respiratory. And so in severe COVID, you'll see those three systems affected and you have to be aware of that. Now that's not just for children, but in young persons also, what they'll have also is headache and they will be affected. So key note, I mean, we think to ourselves that um, only comorbidities or those who are older might be affected. Remember, we've been migrating down and we, so we can be still surprised by having a younger person affected. If you look at the signs of it, all is not common, they can also have especially genetic factors. Now remember, with COVID, they have it affects the heart, the, the lung lining to cause something called ARDS, but it also affects the clots. It produces small clots, large clots. So when you have the small clots, those affect our oxygen levels. So when we have low ones, that might be a small clot formation. But in terms of a large clot, that might need lead to sudden death. So we still can have a few cases where young people are being affected by severe COVID. Now, the third thing to think about to remind you guys is about MIS-C. So remember, we have multi. So it's multi-system, which is the M. I is inflammatory. And the S stands for syndrome in children. So that's MIS-C, M-I-S-C. And the thing is that um, that usually comes up maybe about four to six weeks after the adult surge of um, COVID. So we have seen our surge in May. So we're expecting in late June, early July, they might maybe have a possibility of some increased cases. So with that, we so far have spoken to Dr. Ronan Ramroop. He's our pediatric cardiologist in Trinidad. And our numbers as of today it's 40 Missy cases in Trinidad. Um, confirmed cases, we have 25 that are COVID um, uh, PCR positive or antibody positive, and we have 15 that are PCR or antibody negative. But remember, because Missy comes after COVID infection, 
it's really an immune response to the infection, so they might not be positive. So it's not so very it's very common for them to have no PCR being positive or antibody positive. So just to reiterate that, it's 40 being in confirmed MISI, 25 who are positive COVID, and we have 15 who are negative, and that's our MISI update so far for today, but no deaths up to day, up to this date so far. Just reinforced with Miss C, it has it it's very similar to severe COVID, but the last thing is in condition to the brain, the heart, and the bowel being affected, you also have the mucous membranes. So we're looking at red eyes, red throat, um, red lips, red tongue, um, red palms, red soles of your feet, and also at the tips you'll have something called COVID fingers or COVID toes. So they'll be bluish blackish marks almost like um clots per se that's also and also a rash a general rash over anywhere in terms of it's not a chicken pox rash it's any other type of rash but remember don't see a rash on your child and think oh it could be messy it just has to be a rash in conjunction with everything else that suggests to you that there's a high possibility that this might be messy so for the the next few weeks though i'm appealing to the general public the guardians, the grandparents, the parents, to make sure you have high awareness. We had mentioned this last year, but because we're expecting some increased cases, make sure you look, observe your children, high awareness for any signs of missy, go to your nearest health facility. And we're also going to resend the protocol to all the health professionals to make sure they're aware. We're looking at massive awareness and also really super early aggressive treatment to make sure we take care of our children with missy. The, third, the fourth point to mention is that although we know about the physical aspects of, um, of COVID, we have to remember about the collateral aspects, um, which is affecting children a lot more right now than the physical aspects. So we have the mental health aspect. We have heard um, Professor Gerard Hutchinson speak about this in terms of increased anxiety in children and depression. So we have to be aware of that. Also, the online learning has been a bit difficult in terms of online school. We have increased screen time for us as adults in addition to our children. And we also have it where, um, aside from the screen time, there's safety in the home where we have a lot more patients, a lot more children come into hospital with incidences where they've swallowed something or had some accident at home. So those four categories are things to think about. And we as adults, again, if you're in the plane and something is happening, you put your oxygen on first and then you take care of your child. We have to make sure we maintain our mental health and take care of them. We look at our screen time, reduce our screen time and then take care of them. But also in terms of online learning, do not do their homework for them. Do not be in school for them, but we have to support them. And so where we have to show the example first and then support them during this pandemic, but be aware of all the collateral effects. And the last thing to mention is that in regards to the community, we have seen so far with this pandemic, lots of community networking, lots of volunteerism, persons have been coming out to support the community. So I just want to say congrats to the population for that and just to encourage that because, you know, we always speak about how it used to be long ago with one community um, bringing up a child. So we want to have it one community raising a family, raising a person, raising a child. Let's look out for each other. Look at that elderly person, the person in need in the community, and let's all sort of like come together during this pandemic, even more than we have so far. Thank you very much, CMO. And now? Mm -hmm. And thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Effective home care is critical in the management of COVID patients, not just for the patients themselves, but also for the entire household. I now invite Dr. St. Bernard to share some important and practical tips to prevent you or your relatives from contracting COVID while at home. Dr. St. Bernard. Hello and good morning. Good morning, Dr. Roshan Parasram. Good morning, Dr. Joanne Paul. Good morning to the media and good morning to the members of the viewing and listening public. Thank you all for that warm introduction. Uh, today, as he has said, I will be here to address you, the COVID positive patient who is being managed at home. And I'm also here to speak to you, the caregivers who have taken on the charge and the responsibility and who are in fact now part of the healthcare system, as Dr. Trotman said on sat Saturday, to help with the management of the COVID patient at home. So if we can start with the first slide, 
I'm just going to remind us all of the self-quarantine and isolation tips that have been uh, described in this slide by the Ministry of Health. In terms of our household arrangements, <coughs> if possible, we would ask that persons who are COVID positive sleep in a separate bed or in a separate room. And I emphasize if possible, because we are aware, having managed many, many persons at home, that it is not always possible given the number of persons living in a home and given the number of persons that may need to share a room. But we are saying, please, if possible, and you cannot share a bed, if there is a pullout, if there is a mattress, something that can be placed on the floor, then the person who is COVID positive would get the bed and then someone else would share another space so that there is less risk of exposure. Also, if possible, we would recommend that you use different bathrooms, right? And if it is you're not able to use different bathrooms, then we would need to encourage sanitizing of the bathroom, which I will speak about a little later. And of course, opening the windows to ensure adequate ventilation and a lot of air circulation is always encouraged when a COVID positive person is being managed in the home. Next slide, please. Wearing your mask, we could never emphasize this enough. When someone is COVID positive and at home, we would ask and recommend that they wear a medical grade mask. The patient needs to wear that type of mask and of course they need to wear it as much as possible. Because we are home and we're with family and we're with household uh, members, sometimes we may think, you know, I've been around the persons and maybe they've been exposed already, but we really want to encourage us to go back to wearing the mask at home if you've been tested and you are in fact COVID positive. And of course, change the mask regularly. If it is, it becomes wet, if it becomes dirty from secretions and by change, if it's a disposable mask, of course, it would need to be discarded. Next slide, please. Respiratory hygiene is also something that is very, very important for the COVID positive person and their household members to be reminded of. You need to practice rigorous respiratory hygiene. And by that, what do we mean? Cough or sneeze into your elbow or a tissue and then immediately dispose of this tissue. And of course, thereafter, wash hands with soap and water. Next slide. In terms of self-quarantining and isolating at home, <clears throat> the reason that I'm here is to really emphasize that even though we are managing the COVID positive persons in the home, we still want to reduce as much as possible person to person transmission. It, it should not be assumed that because there is a COVID positive person in the home, everyone in the home must get COVID. That is not what we're saying at all. So again, do not share. We need to stop sharing. We have to switch modes. Yes, these are your relatives. These are your loved ones. But if you are COVID positive and the other members of your home are not COVID positive, do not share towels. Do not share cutlery. Do not share your glasses when you are drinking your water. And of course, everyone in the home, as we said, wear masks as much as possible and stay away. Stay as far as you can from the persons that are COVID positive. Use soap and water to clean face coverings or discard after use. I cannot emphasize enough how much we need to ensure that anything that was used to cover the nose and mouth of a person who is COVID positive, that needs to either be discarded or cleaned appropriately with soap and water. We need to be careful as well when actually handling the mask. So caregivers who are also wearing a medical mask that covers their mouth and nose when they're in the same room as the patient, need to remember, do not touch the mask that's while it's on your face. And of course, when removing the mask, you will untie or unhook from your ears. Do not touch the front of the mask. <coughs> if the mask gets wet from dirt or secretions, again, we are saying throw it away immediately. Replace it with a clean one. And also, we are asking for the COVID positive persons at home to not move around the home as they normally would. We are asking you to restrict movement. So just like we ask the population to restrict movement by staying at home, we are now asking you, the COVID positive person within the home, to remain as much as possible in one room of that home. You should not be getting up and saying, I'm going to watch a little movie with the family in the living room and then I'm coming to the dining table, but I'll just sit far from everyone. We are asking for the period of your isolation within your home that you restrict yourself as much as possible to one room in the home. 
And of course, if you are sharing a space, please, please open those windows. Do not mingle freely. Do not have people coming into your room apart from the primary caregiver. And of course, even when that person comes in, they need to still, as much as possible, not come within six feet of you. And remember, no one is scorning you. Your family members are not scorning you. They're not saying they don't like you anymore. They're not saying something is wrong with you. It is literally an infectious disease. And the best way to, pr to protect your loved ones would be to allow them to distance themselves from you while in the home. No visitors are allowed. So visitors should not be coming into the home at this time. You're not to have, you know, Tanti and, and, and um, Granny and all these people <coughs> coming to visit the person who is sick. Because, you know, well, there's a sick person that we need to visit. We have to do the opposite. We have to Zoom call, video call, WhatsApp call. But do not come into the home when there is a COVID positive person. And for items that need to be dropped off to the home, please collect those items at the gate and this is not the COVID positive person I'm speaking to now I'm talking to the household members they need to go to the gate to the fence collect whatever items are left there for the person in the home and for you all and then we proceed to move on next slide so we have here now the image of the toilet and I thought it was important to even talk about how to share a toilet because everyone will not have extra bathrooms in their home such that a COVID positive person has their own bathroom. So if you are in fact sharing a bathroom, it is important that you clean the handle of the toilet where you would normally hold to flush. That needs to be sanitized after each use. Many people think of the seat, you know, as being the, the most unhygienic part, but guess what? It is the handle of the toilet, right? Where your hands are, that needs to be wiped. You need to close the toilet lid after each use when you are before you flush <coughs> because that will allow of course when you flush particles to not then you know be getting all over the bathroom and of course keeping your counters clear of like toothbrushes and all of that would then mean you also prevent any particles from landing on those items there is a way to receive meals at the home so if you are in your own room we would ask that people leave your the meals for you outside of your door uh, and when you're finished eating, you leave the dishes on the floor outside of your room. If food is delivered to the home as well, that person who is bringing food again is not to leave the food, uh, not to enter the home, but to leave it by the gate as much as possible. What we're trying to do here, folks, is prevent multiple rounds of self-isolation for members within a household. Because I'm sure some of you would have experienced you've been home for 14 days or more because someone in the home was positive and then someone else becomes positive and it is like you're having to submit several quarantine orders to your employers so we're trying to prevent that in terms of the actual considerations clinical considerations for the person at home next slide we're looking at symptomatic treatment so for persons who are with COVID-19 the World Health Organization recommends treatment as follows if you have fever the fancy word we use in medicine antipyretics those are things like paracetamol for fever and pain. But also, if it is you have mild COVID and at home, we also need to remember adequate nutrition as well as appropriate rehydration. When Dr. Trotman was here on Saturday, she spoke about dehydration being a very, very basic presentation of COVID positive persons coming to hospital presenting just literally too dry, right? In terms of antibiotics, antibiotics are not to be used as prevention and we really want to discourage persons from requesting of their physicians, I'm home with COVID, can I get some antibiotics please? The World Health Organization also advises against antibiotic prophylaxis or for treatment of patients with mild COVID-19. Persons with moderate COVID-19, antibiotics will only be prescribed if there is the signs or symptoms or any kind of suggestion of bacterial infection because antibiotic, antibiotics will only work for bacterial infections and of course our chronic disease patients who are at home they would need to have their medications always available so that they don't then go into uncontrolled diabetes uncontrolled hypertension in addition to having COVID-19 so patients with COVID-19 infection and chronic diseases who are being managed at home we need to ensure an adequate supply of medication Older people should always have at least a two-week supply. And of course, any repeat, repeat prescriptions and refills 
those will be brought to the home and dropped off, but never by someone who is in quarantine and never by someone who is a contact of the COVID-19 patient. The reason that we need to talk about hydration for the COVID-19 persons is because if it is you get fever, if you develop fever with COVID-19, which then leads to an increase in temperature, what that does is it causes basically you to have an increased need for fluids. And so sometimes even though you've got loss of appetite and you have, um, you know, you're tired and you're not thirsty, we are wanting to emphasize to the COVID positive patients today, please, please keep in mind that you need to be drinking because you are dehydrated and you may not realize it. You have lost some fluids because of the fever. Drink at least three liters of fluid, clear fluids, and of course, ideally, water, not ever sugary drinks. And the last thing I want to talk about today for the COVID-19 persons at home would be the issue of cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting. These are terms I know that you all would have heard us use. So I just wanted to say, what is cleaning? Because sometimes we think we're disinfecting when in fact we're just cleaning. Cleaning removes germs, dirts, uh, dirt and impurities from surfaces or objects. Cleaning works by using soap and water to physically remove the germs from the surface. It does not necessarily kill the germs. It is just removing them physically. Disinfecting, on the other hand, kills germs. Disinfecting is what we want because it kills the germs on surfaces or objects and they work together. Disinfecting works by using chemicals to kill the germs on the surfaces or objects and it does not necessarily clean a dirty surface but it will kill the germs on the surface after it has been cleaned. And so sanitizing is a term we use to mean lowering the number of germs on a surface or object to a safe level as judged by public health standards or requirements. So this process of sanitizing works either by cleaning or disinfecting. So you're removing the germs and you're also killing the germs. So this is what we mean when we talk about cleaning and sanitizing and disinfecting. And of course, don't forget your cell phones and don't forget your screens, your computers. Cell phones are things that we always have in our hand and sometimes other people hold our phones and that's something also to be discouraged. But you need to use disinfecting wipes on your cell phones every day. And of course, pay close attention to the chemicals. Make sure your phone can handle it and see if it is you need to use more than one wet wipe to clean your phone. When it comes to the waste that is generated in the home from managing your COVID-19 person at home, remember that this would be considered COVID waste and so you need to put it into a strong bag and dispose of it carefully uh, when you're putting out of your, your garbage. And I would end of course on a very positive note, a message of hope. We thank you, we thank you and we thank you, the public for continuing to be an active partner in the national fight against COVID-19. We thank you for your, your support, for your coming out for your vaccines, because together, as everyone has been saying, if we continue to wash our hands, wear our mask, and watch our distance, we will win this war against COVID-19. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Dr. Sid Bernal, for a very informative presentation. We are now moving into the question and answer segment. Our media representatives are asked to pose their questions to members of the panel and state their name and media house. Because our time is always limited, we are asking that a maximum of two brief questions per media house be asked. We begin today with 98.1. And a very good morning to you, Mr. Alexander, and of course the panel, Dr. Prasram, uh, Dr. St. Bernard, and um, the other uh, uh, doctor um, on the panel. Uh, Stephen Cummings, 98.1 FM, are my two questions uh, quickly. Um, Dr. Prasram, I wanted to pose this question to you, seeing that uh, the Minister of Health, um, Minister De Singh, is not here, and um, it may, a question may take you somewhat out of your comfort zone, but uh, I pose it anyway. Um, my first question to you. Um, one official from the Trinidad and Tobago Coalition of Services Industries, that's the TTCSI, spoke with me and um, there were some concerns about an apparent disconnect or a discontinuation of the state's partnership 
with the private sector on uh, this very same uh, present uh, management of the health system. It's being argued that there continues to be widespread untapping of skills in the private sector, especially uh, when it comes to program and event management. Um, uh, there is a view that um, even with what we would have seen on Wednesday could have been mitigated somewhat had there been um, more of an involvement of the private sector from an event management viewpoint. So I'm not sure if you can respond to that. If not, I would pose the question again uh, when the minister is um, available. And uh, Dr. St. Bernard, um, you talked about the wearing and uh, the use of, of masking. Um, I saw on the last uh, press conference um, one of the um, presenters, speakers at the podium, um, and I counted no less than 11 times where uh, the person had to be adjusting the face mask um, and, and you know, con continuously, constantly touching the face and adjusting the face mask. Um, this obviously is, is at some variance to what you have just mentioned in terms of the use of, of masking. Maybe uh, we need to go back to, to some of those, um, you know, focusing on some of those basics um, where masking is concerned. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mr. Cummings, yeah, just briefly on, on your point, I'm not aware that of that particular group. However, I think we have answered the question as it relates to private sector involvement. The ministry in no way has um, has anything against the private sector being involved. Actually, we have put out notifications in the press on more than one occasion asking for volunteers for our vaccine program, as well as other aspects of care during the COVID-19 epidemic, the recent one, last recent one, I think is a couple of weeks ago. And as you know, we continue to partner with the private sector for vaccine initiatives across the country. So it is being done already um, uh, in terms of further depth, I suppose, the Honourable Minister, when you get a chance, um, we'll go into further detail. Sure. Thank you very Dr. much. Saint Dr. St. Bernard. Hi. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Cummings, for your question. And that is a very good point that you raised, that... Uh, you know, for all of us, we do need to focus on making sure that we have masks that fit comfortably and fit well, such that we would not be required to continually adjust them. It's almost like part of your clothing, just like you would want your jacket and so to fit snug and fit properly. I think that's just something we do need to reemphasize and remind ourselves, even as uh, healthcare providers and everyone in the public that when we are leaving home, we do have masks that fit well. So we, sometimes you, bear, you may purchase a box of, of masks and then when you actually put it on, you realize you know, it's hanging, it's, it's just, it keeps sliding down. You need to make adjustments, maybe tighten up the loops and so, so that you never have to touch the front of your mask while wearing it. So we do thank you for your comments and observation, Mr. Cummings. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. We quickly move to the Express. Express, we are ready for your call. Your questions? Hi, good morning. Kim Bodram from the Express. I'm not sure I'm being heard. Yes, you are. Please ask your okay, question. Thank you. Morning. The CMO might be the most appropriate person to address my questions. Uh, CMO, can you tell us if the Ministry of Health was aware of uh, uh, that the 80 vials of Pfizer vaccines from the United States, this donation, was incoming on Saturday when uh, when the ministry would have held a press conference, including the health minister, the prime minister, and so on, because no word of that was given. Normally, it is announced any vaccines coming into the country. Also, it's obviously a very sensitive topic, and the public feels very strongly about transparency in the vaccine issue right now. Would you, the national security minister has said that those, those vials are for use by national security, but would you be able to give us any more information as to who in national security uh, would be receiving those vaccines? Thank you. Okay, yeah, so the Ministry of Health would have been made aware of the incoming shipment prior to, just prior to its arrival into Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and that second bit of your question related to national security. I, I think that's better posed to national security. They will know, and Minister Hines would have made a statement indicating that it is for national security without giving further detail. So I think that question will be, second question, be better posed to national security. Thank you for your question. Express, we quickly go to Tobago Channel 5. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Candice Jackson from Tobago Channel 5 News. Um, I have two questions, and most likely the CMO will answer them. 
Uh, my first question is in regards to the CMOH in Tobago. We have information that letters have been written to the Ministry of Health as well as you um, to have her removed. I was wondering if you have any information on that and what can you share with us? And also, what is the process for to be able to receive their tests from COVID-19? Because we continue to get reports that persons are waiting upwards of two weeks to get their results and it is affecting persons' um, leaves and so on from their work. Um, so can you just give us some details as to those two things? Thank you. So I have up to date, I have no correspondence from Tobago asking myself in terms of my office to have the CMOH removed. Um, the matter remains under the purview of the Tobago House of Assembly either way. Um, COVID-19 tests, so COVID-19 tests in Tobago are done in two streams. So one, they have their own gene expert machine, which is a rap, uh, machine that can turn over tests very quickly um, within about 45 minutes when they use both, co both um, components at the same time. So they have, if for any severely ill person, they can actually confirm very quickly. Another, any further test beyond that, when, when you mild to moderate, they send it to Trinidad and to Trinidad, and that normally comes, and there's usually a turnaround time, I would say between two to three days in the best of circumstances. Generally speaking, as you have seen in the national community, because of the large number of tests, especially in April and May, there has been a further delay. So it has affected not only Tobago, but in other parts of Trinidad, the results were taking a little bit longer to get back some as far as three to five days um, on average. So as the number of tests come down again, hopefully and the numbers decrease, we will go back to that sort of status quo two to three days across the country in the coming weeks. Hope that answers your question. Thank you, Siabu. We now go to AZP News. Hi, good morning, Private Harry, AZP News. Um, Siabu, I just want to touch back on Kim's question. Um, um, the whole issue, I think, with, uh, with the Pfizer vaccines coming in is that whether it is so simple as someone um, walks with a letter to state that there are these vaccines that is coming in the country. I mean, is there, um, you know, a more, um, I would say, a level, um, a stringent measures that could come in um, okay. to bring those vaccines in? Um, you know, it, it seems that that before we didn't, it, it was much more stringent than now. So I just want you um, to elaborate a, sure. a little more on that. And second secondly, question, um, yes. yeah. And second question is um, whether, um, uh, why is it that these vaccines would go to national security and not go sure. elsewhere? What, what, is, what is the procedure? What are the criteria that is used in the selection of certain vaccines for certain groups. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, let me see if I could answer the questions in one go. So the um, Ministry of National Security would have been in contact with their counterpart agency in the U.S. and therefore received a, a donation, and I think Minister Hines referred to it as a gift, of the 400 vaccines of Pfizer. So there was communique between the two, the Ministry of National Security and their counterpart in the U.S., that donation was forthcoming to them. We were alerted as the, as the Ministry of Health with responsibility for two things, the importation of vaccines as well as the regulation of vaccines. So customs would have alerted us when it was actually in the airport. Our principal pharmacists would have actually gone in physically and took control of the vaccines. We now have it in a bonded facility, which means that it's bonded pending use. All right, so the Ministry of Health has taken control of it and what we are waiting for is some documentation that the Ministry of National Security has to provide to us via the, the, the US that their counterpart agency so that we could do two things one we expect to get some information as it relates to invoicing which is part and parcel of the importation requirements and two the regulatory documents in terms of a, a clinical dossier which will allow us to see where the Pfizer product was manufactured and all of that it would be considered by the Drug Advisory Committee, and then we can say whether it is a, pro, uh, a uh, vaccine that can be utilized in Trinidad and Tobago. Once those documents come to us, we review it, and we see that it's satisfactory, then the vaccines will be handed over to national security for their use. So that's generally the process. Thank you for your response, CMO, and, and of course, your question. 
vaccine. Here's a question, let him ask. The, yes, the yes, prior. Choice, um, you know, why, why was this, who were sure. these vaccines? So, vaccine? again, that, that, um, that discussion was, again, between national security and that UN, U.S. agency. So I think that will be better posed to them. All right. Thank you very much. We move to Astronaut Health News. When I stood, Astronaut Health News, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, a few persons are reporting that their employees are hinting that they must take the vaccine in order to resume work. My questions are, if someone is compelled to get vaccinated and experiences serious side effects, who accepts liability? And my second question, how can the layman go about proving short or long-term negative post-vaccination outcomes were as a result of vaccination? Thank you. Okay. So generally speaking, as we have said more than once on this program, Having the vaccine for COVID-19 right at this point in Trinidad and Tobago is a voluntary process. So really it is voluntary at this point. Um, so the matter of liability I don't think arises if it be if it's a voluntary process. Um, in terms of the layman being able to prove, I don't think that the layman should try to prove whether a vaccine, uh, some symptom that they have is related to or not in terms of the vaccine. What, what we do is of course we look out as we have said before for certain signs and symptoms post vaccination. If you have those things and you find they are severe in nature, you contact your physician or go back to your health center right away. Let them know what you have so you safeguard your health as that's the first consideration when we're looking at post-vaccine um, reactions. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, CMO. Radio Tamron, we are ready for your questions. All right, good morning, Clayton Clark, Radio Tamron. Um, Morning, questions Clayton. from the public um, mm -hmm. members of the public are asking about the reopening of furniture and appliance stores one uh, bookstores have been open but some PE teachers physical education teachers are asking about sporting stores open because some of the students have to get equipment for physical education exams and my second question Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley made reference on Saturday on how well this country is coping with the COVID-19 pandemic compared to other Caribbean countries. I'm asking if you can put that comment into context, given the differences in vaccine access, demographics, vac vaccine hesitancy, etc. As much as we ought to be lifted by that observation, are you happy with where we are in the fight against the virus? I think that's for Dr. Paraswam. Okay, so Thank you. I think both questions, um, we, we, as you know, in terms of the medical team, we continue to make recommendations as we see fit based on the epidemiological patterns of disease in the country. We continue to do so um, through our line minister, the Minister of Health, as well as sometimes the Minister of National Security. And then of course, consideration is given to our recommendations. As you know, I think um, on Saturday they would have lifted some restrictions related to the um, stationary supply stores, which is to facilitate, as was said on Saturday, um, students going into that particular examination period. So all that, that decision was made based on that. Um, again, we have not recommended anything further as of Saturday, but as we continue to go forward, as the numbers are reviewed, number of vaccines increased, we will continue as the Ministry of Health to make our recommendations and ultimately the decision will be made by the Honourable um, Prime Minister. In terms of, I wouldn't want to even garner a guess into um, the Honourable Prime Minister's comment. To be honest, I think he was speaking more about the, the vaccine distribution across the Caribbean at the time, um, if I remember right, but I wouldn't want to go into any further detail in terms of commentary on what he has said. Thank you very much, CMO and Clayton Clark, Radio Tamron. I-95.5, ready for your yes. questions. Yes, good morning to you all and to everyone there. Um, my one question coming in this morning um, is seeking to get some clarity with the Sinopharm vaccine. We are being told that persons who take the Sinopharm vaccine will not be able to travel to the UK. Can you shed some light on that to see whether it is true or not? Okay. All right, so the Sinopharm vaccine is, as you know, a WHO approved vaccine. 
um, every country in the world has its right to say uh, being a sovereign state as to who can travel to their country um, at this point in time our policy in Trinidad and Tobago is to give a WHO approved vaccine as best practice to the population of the country and that is what we will continue to do based on availability um, it would depend on which one of the WHO approved vaccines we're giving so I, I can't comment on any country's restriction as it relates to incoming um, but again it, it really is some there, there needs to be some due diligence on the part of the individual traveling prior to traveling to ensure that you look into the, the country's requirements and then of course um, you do your due diligence on your personal part thank you very much CMO Guardian Media Limited you are next hi good day good morning hi Renuka Singh at the Trinidad Guardian um, if I could follow on any questions posed by both uh, Kim Bodram and Priya Bihari the CMO is saying that customs alerted the health officials when the drugs were already in the country. What I'm trying to find out is that a normal course of action should the health officials have been alerted prior to the um, COVID-19 vaccines landing in the country. And is this the first time that something like this has happened where a gift, they are not alerted to the gift coming in and they have to take um, control of the, of the product? So yeah, in answering the first question, you remember I said we were alerted prior to it arriving in the country. When it actually got physically to customs, that is when my principal pharmacist would have been notified that it was there, and she actually physically went to receive it. So that is the course of events that occurred. It's not that we weren't aware that it was coming, but when it actually landed and it was in the possession of customs, we then spoke to customs and we, we went ahead and took it from them into our bonded area. Thank you very much. Um, Newsday, your, your two questions, please. Good morning, everyone. Rihanna McKenzie here from Newsday. Um, my first question is for Dr. St. Bernard. Um, you mentioned that the goal for those in home isolation is to reduce the spread within the home. Um, do you have any idea on average from those in the home, in home isolation at present, how common or easy it is for other family members to contract the virus once a, a COVID positive person has been identified. Um, my second question, I'm hoping the CMO will be able to answer. Um, I'd just like some clarification on how exactly um, dentists, veterinarians, pharma pharmacists, and paramedics are going to administer the vaccine uh, in terms of uh, will citizens, citizens be given a, a list of names um, is there going to be an appointment system and when will it start? Okay, thank you. Thank you for All your right, question. Bernard, thank you, Ms. McKenzie. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> so I don't have actual figures to tell you the rate of transmission within the homes when there is a COVID positive person being managed in the home. But given the um the sheer number of persons that ha are being managed, uh and the numbers that we would have seen coming out of the homes. I would say that the, the risk is there and it's always there, but it all depends on the extent to which persons are able to isolate away from other members in the home. And even in terms of detecting the number of persons, say, that would have then become infected with COVID, it would all depend on the extent to which, you know, they present with symptoms or they are then uh, swabbed as primary contacts of the case. So it would be difficult to give you actual figures right now, but I think that uh, for my county, I would I would say that we have seen many persons managed in the home and many relatives who are household contacts not going on to develop COVID. So it is possible. It's not as if it's a 100% transmission rate once you are sharing a home with someone who is COVID positive. So I hope that that helps. Okay. Yeah. So just much. to clarify this issue with the dental, veterinary, personnel and all of that. So generally speaking, what, what had happened at the Ministry of Health, we had reached out to certain groups of the medical fraternity, dentists, pharmacists, um, veterinarians, as well as the EMT personnel, and as the paramedic class, to actually get volunteers to do vaccinations on behalf of the Ministry of Health at the mass vaccination sites and other sites. So they are people that will be working with the Ministry of Health. It's not that 
those dentists or veterinarians will be working independently in their own offices and giving vaccination. So they are part of the team that will be utilized for as vaccinators at the mass vaccine sites and other sites within the ministry. And just um, to clarify, they have to be under the supervision of a medical practitioner as is spelled out in the new regulation, which is regulation legal notice 179 under the hand of the Honorable uh, of the President on the 12th day of June 2021. And it includes categories like nursing personnel, dentists, veterinary surgeons, medical interns, dental interns, paramedics, and pharmacists. So they'll be working along with the Ministry of Health at the vaccination sites set up by the Ministry or its affiliates and doing that under the supervision of a medical practitioner. Thank you very much. We do have some time for a few more questions, so now we will take one brief, brief question per media house. We now go to AZP News. Hi, good morning again. Um, um, Simo, I just wanted to, to touch back again with this Pfizer issue. Um, if it is the Ministry of Health knew that the vaccines were coming in, did you make a request for all of the proper documents to come in with those vaccines? And and so so therefore, it seems that these documents were not brought in. So it gives the impression that maybe these vaccines um, were trying to come in um, a bit secretly or being brought in secretly. So, you know, I, I'm just trying to get to understand why wasn't the proper documents brought in if the ministry knew this before, like has happened in the past with the Sinopharm and the AstraZeneca vaccine? Sure. I, Thank I, you. Again, the initiation of this whole process was through national security, and I think that question will be better posed to national security. Uh, thank you very much, CMO. We now go to 98.1. We're ready for your follow-up question. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Alexander. Um, I want to go back, um, or I want to address this question to Dr. Paul. Um, regarding the management of children, um, you know, within, uh, within the home as well, uh, because the uh, mention was made about um, uh, children can also, um, you know, fall victim. We have evidence of that, um, fall victim to COVID-19. Um, is there a policy, um, really, uh, that treats with the management of children um, who may be exposed or who would have been exposed to COVID-19 uh, within, the, within the home environment? Um, I, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm actually seeing where there is a, a, you know, a specific policy, and I'm talking about um, in our local um, system for the, the proper management of children um, who are exposed to such um, uh, well, the viruses as we, as we have mentioned. Thank you, thank you for that, Mr. Cummins. Actually, we don't have a specific policy because we follow the same guidelines as the home care guidelines that Dr. St. Bernard was going through. The difference is that um, with the children, they will just follow our cues. So once we have it where, first of all, if they are not the, um, the index case, so if they are in the home and there's somebody else who is infected, we have to make sure we show them how to be away from the person and follow the guidelines. And if it's the reverse, where they themselves are infected, we also have to make sure that they maintain their isolation with a family member. Obviously, we can't have that child by themselves isolated. So they will be there with the primary contact, whether the adult is um, infected or not, but they'll have to be staying with a family member, but they have to, we have to show them how to stay in the isolation. And I think it's a little bit challenging because at that point in time, we have to make sure that we um, so I keep them occupied, but I think most persons so far have been doing that, been a little bit inventive. But once we show them what to do and show them that we're okay with it, they will follow our example and really maintain the standards. And as we said, the three W's, once you tell them all the time, they actually follow your lead. Thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Paul. We'll go back to Radio Tambrin for our next follow-up question. All right, good morning again. Uh, this question is really from journalists in Tobago. Uh, we're having a challenge with contributing to the Prime Minister's press conference. I know here may not be the platform, but we have been dealing with the communication unit. We're not able to participate in the Saturday or whenever the Prime Minister has his press conference via Zoom. So we're just asking if you all could convey that concern that we have. And that's my question. Oh, my concern. 
Okay, we'll, we'll do. It will certainly be passed on. Thank you very much. We, go, we now move to the news day. Good morning again. Um, my quick question is uh, recently the UK pledged a donation of 100 million AstraZeneca vaccines with an initial 5 million to be rolled out in the coming weeks. Any indication if we will be receiving from that and if so, when? Thank you. Thank you. See you more. I mean, I, I personally am not privy to that level of discussion, but I mean, seeing what I have seen out in the public domain, that I believe the 100 million was pledged to the COVAX facility, if I'm not mistaken, and the, the government, um, we're really part of the COVAX facility, so if we are to get any of those, it will be through our existing COVAX arrangement. Thank you very much, CMO. Guardian Media Limited, we are ready for your follow-up question. Hi, thank you very much. Um, CMO, if you can just give us a little more detail as to when exactly the health officials were made aware that the Pfizer vaccines were coming into the country, because you said you were prior notice, but yeah. could you tell us, was that days, hours, what exactly is prior notice? And um, my second question though, that I asked before wasn't responded, there was no response to it, which is that, is this the first time that the health officials had to take this sort of action where they take control of the vaccines and they wait for the documentation? Okay, so I can't give you an exact time. I mean, it's multiple health officials involved, so I'll have to get a time from, from the others, the principal pharmacists, food and drug department. So I don't have an exact time when they were notified, to be honest. Um, the, I, I believe um, there have been donations of multiple vaccines from different countries, as you all have known, over the coming, over the last couple of weeks in particular. So there have been instances where um, we would have had short notice as well for those in terms of time. Um, I don't know, and all other, all those um, vaccines prior would have come to, to the Ministry of Health as well and gone into the hands of the principal pharmacists. Thank you very much, CMO. Uh, our last follow-up question goes to the Express. Ready for your question. Morning again, Kim Bodram, Express, uh, CMO. So I hope this question is not uninformed, but it seems that while the daily infection rate is very slowly going down, um, the, the, the unfortunate fatalities, COVID-19 related fatalities, while they had gone up uh, quite high very briefly and then they came back down to a sort of average that seems to be holding steady. Is there any trend aside from comorbidities that, because we're seeing younger people as well, is there any other trend health-wise in these fatalities that, um, that's emerging that the public needs to be aware of? because the deaths don't seem to be going down as quickly, unfortunately. I, I hope that question was clear, thanks. Well, I mean, I, Dr. Hines would have gone through the, the trends in terms of the ages on Saturday, um, and he'd probably be back on Wednesday to do uh, some further detail into the trends. He hasn't alerted me to any sort of untoward change, aside from what we have noticed in terms of a change in the gender distribution. Um, what was 75% was male, 25% female last year, now seems to be more 60-40 in the way of um, so females more accounting for a larger proportion this year than last year. There's a slight age um, drop in terms of going from the above 60s is coming down a little bit into the 50s but other than those two um, indicators which he had presented on I don't think there was anything significant that, that came to light but again he'll present on Wednesday and then we, we go forward from there. Thank you very much CMO. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's media conference. Thank you for participating. Please note the vaccination rollout recommences on Wednesday, 17 June, for persons 65 years old and over. Remember to be fully hey, vaccinated. Well, you know what, earlier, must I heard get your <laughs> second <laughs> shot. And even though you're vaccinated, still practice the three W's to continue to protect yourself and your loved ones. Wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear a mask. Have a good day, everyone, and remember, become a blood donor today. Donating keeps you healthy, and it can save a life, which could very well be your own. Stay safe, and goodbye for now.
Este verso que les voy a contar trata sobre un virus al que entre todos le vamos a ganar. Más pequeño que un botón, que no te engañe su tamaño, ya que aunque sea chiquito, causa bastante daño. Antes de comer o después de ir al baño, hay que lavarse las manos cantando el feliz cumpleaños. Pero si justo estás afuera y no tenés una canilla, nunca te toques la cara ni pierdas la zapatilla. También podés lavarte, tenés que tener en cuenta, con alcohol en gel las manos aunque arda como pimienta. Tu distancia con otros tenés que preservar, un metro o una escoba deberían bastar. Cuando estés adentro abrigate, nunca tengas frío.